if uh, you find it worthwhile. Um, you may wonder why we're talking about spider mites at this season. There's a little bit of method to my madness, but I have been getting a number of calls of mites being seen in trees. And it just so happens that I did quite a bit of work on mites being seen in trees at this time of year. I did quite a bit of work on that very issue when I was in, in Bakersfield. Um, these very warm winters, and even sometimes in moderately wet winters, you will see that. Before I get right into it, though, I want to say that if you haven't had a dormant spray on, you're thinking of your disease spray and what to do about twig borer as more of a preventative in that. We are getting movement of twig borer out from the bud. So any disease sprays that you'll be putting on now, um, you could include a product like BT or Dipel or Intrepid, any of those. Uh, uh, um, shoot, there's one other. Dimelin that can go into this. They're all very effective during the bloom, just petal fall period for peach quick more if you happen to miss your, uh, your uh, uh, dormant spray, and, and that's fine. I think uh, it's a good alternative, a cheap way to go without having to pay for the right of the chemical. Uh, twig borer last year we had no damage whatsoever in any of the 13 orchards. Uh, all the damage we had, most of the able orange worm problem was very low. There's a couple of orchards that were uh, often damaged a little, and I think we can get a handle on it. But today I want to spend time uh, talking about the biology, I know this, you, you guys want something meaty to take home with you. How can I, I love that slide that Pete had, that guy with the hammer, how can I take care of this problem and deal with it? The biology of this mite, uh, Pacific mite in particular, is really important in how we approach our management. I want you to get confident, not to worry if you see mites in the trees right now, I want to show you uh, where to look for those. Okay, we've got the primary mite. There are actually two species, but the one most commonly seen is the Pacific mite. You won't see this right now. They're going to be coming up either from the deep bark area or from the soil moving up in the lower crotch. Right now it's about the, the uh, height of your hips when you walk up to a, a tree. That's where they're migrating and establishing in the tree. Um, let me go back one here. And then something we're not seeing as much as we have in the past is the western predator mite. Now, with these mites focusing on those interior crotch trees, where you've got this establishing on those leaves, if you've got predators, you will have this predator there. So it's very, very important that you, if you see that in your trees, look at it now. Take a look, use a hand lens, or bring it to someone that has a hand lens. I've been trying to stress to the ag chem groups, buy a damn microscope. <laughs> buy a microscope, not for your use, but for a farmer to come in and use to help educate him on what he's got in his orchard. It's really, really important, I think, and uh, establish some credibility. Okay, there's a lot of confusion. I'll go through this particular slide. I want to show you the foundation of why most of us in extension have been negative on the use of pyrethroids. Not in terms of the pests that they control, but in the subsequent buildup of spider mites. This work was done in 1985 and 1986 when the monocytes or the pyrethroids were first coming out. And it refers to two years. Treatments done for insects in 19... Treatments done in insects in 1983. And nothing done in 1984 but the development of spider mites, okay? So in 1983, we've done this in four different areas of the state, from Durham all the way down to Bakersfield. We put on three rates of cyfluprin, which is uh, uh, a pyrethroid, flucyphronate, which is another pyrethroid, permethrin, and those went on at two different dates. 
But then this is really the more focused area. Permethrin, which is ambush and pounce. Seven, diazinon, and then we had trees that were untreated. So we put these on at label rates, and we treated these. Let's just focus here on these. A single treatment in August 9th, closed 1983. Then we took mite counts in 1983. Prior to the treatment, we had no mites. Subsequent to the treatment, look at the control. Zero mites were beginning to build in all of the treatments, whether they were diazinon or pyrethroids. And by a month after that treatment, we had a severe problem with spider mites during the year of application. Remember, these are four different groups of pyrethroids. Many of these, I'm trying to think of the trade name, and they're escaping me right now for those cyflucrin and flucyphronate. But, um, and then look at the uh, 8th of September, the last reading we took. Look at the untreated. We had 12% of the leaves that had mites versus 62, 64. So all of these, whether they were diazinon, seven, permethrin, or these double applications of these others, had mites. The following year, the following year we came in. Nothing else was done. Nothing else was done in here. And we began to measure mite populations. Wherever we had the pyrethroids, we began picking up this percentage of leaves with mites. Look at the untreated control. Even seven here did not show the problem. Diazinan had a whole population. This was March. March, right almost right to where we are now. April, you see that population building. Now, nothing was done in this, in this block. No insecticides or no other miticides. May, where the pyrethroids were used. This is right down to here. <coughs> seven, diazinon, carbaryl. By the July of 1984, 93% with the double, 100% with the highest rate of the double applications, 96 to 98%, where we had a single uh, permethrin application, we had 88%, almost 85, uh, 9 percent of the leaves, 34%, 35% with carbaryl, 40% um, with diazinon, and 40% with uh, nothing that went on. So it shows the impact you have with a permethrin spray. A seven dollar spray that went on in 83 would result in subsequent problems with mites the following year. Part of that can be attributed, this was the uh, predator mites, our predator population was very low in this particular block. The same slide, except that the infants percent of the leaves here show predator mite. Our predator population was very low. The point being that it wasn't necessarily the predators that were being removed. It was the impact of that spray on the movement and the development and the reproduction of spider mites. So how does that happen? Something done in 1983 that would affect the population in 1984. Oh, I want to go through. This was in the Fresno area. This had a, a, a treatment that either went on in May for naval orangeworm or went on in uh, a hull split for naval orangeworm. Again, control untreated, thiam, seven, and permethrin. Treatment made in 1983, you can see the immediately jump in the seven application, a little more delay. This was the May treatment in the mite uh, percent of leaves infested with mites with a permethrin, and even a more delay in the percent of mites treated with, uh, uh, sampled with uh, glutathione. We're beginning to level off here with the, the untreated. Came back in 1984. Darn it. Uh, um, <coughs> the only population that was substantially higher was that with permethrin. This is the, the point being, yes, it is a cheap application, it is an effective application on naval orangeworm, but eventually you're going to have to deal with mites. Right now, it seems like a minor problem. 
it seems like a minor issue because we're all putting on a miticide whether it's needed or not. But this goes back to what Pete has been saying. When you continue to use a single product for mites, there's going to come a, 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 a time when those chickens come home to roost. And we're going to have to be able to deal with that mite problem. And that cheaper application for methrin may not uh, seem as cheap as it, it shows. Now, but this, is, this also goes to the reason why, okay, this is the whole split application. In May, you can see a little more of a separation of the impact of, of uh, mite development based on insecticide use, the untreated. But when you go to pulse split, all of these pretty much um, develop later into August. All right? But the same of impact the subsequent year, 1983 sprays, 1984, April, May, populations of mites. This is permethrin, this one's carbaryl, and this is either guthion or the untreated. So I just want to drive that home, that it's a two-year impact. So now I'm going to go into, why does this happen? What, what, what is the effect that these mites have? Well, when, when you look at a severely infested orchard that has mites, those leaves drop to the ground. To me, I began thinking, is that a suicidal drop? Is that something, I mean, is that a wasted life for that mite? Is it going to drop and die? The point is, it doesn't. It survives in the soil. So, uh, late Jimmy R.B. with Bernard Farms clued me in on this. And he says, well, you know, we've got this orchard. It's only about a six-leaf orchard. He says, I'm finding mites on the drip heads, and I'm finding mites running up and down the sprinkler line. <laughs> so, I got the idea, well, let's, let's go out there and fool around a little. We began to ban trees with uh, duct tape and tangle foot. This is the wintering population. You can see that red population moving up from the soil. This was a relatively uh, uh, dry year. It was 1990. You can see the number of mites that are stuck on this support, uh, on the bottom part of this uh, tree. Actually, there was an article done on, on this in one of the magazines, and they got the picture upside down. Because it just didn't seem logical that mites would be moving up from the soil. But we did work that showed that they winter primarily around the base of the tree. And during bloom, that movement is triggered up into the leaves. And then, these are the first areas that they establish. And they remain there for a good long time. You look at this, and then as the leaves begin to drop out, on older trees, you'll not only get wintering on the ground, but you'll get wintering in the deep bark areas, particularly those that have had uh, uh, shaker damage. You'll get mites wintering into those cracks. And if you look, you go out and you start looking, you know, this is great for an environmentalist because as they hug that tree, you, you, will, actually, you will actually see those mites. You become much more intimate with this. <laughs> but this is a photo I took in Modesto where we were getting mites during that bloom period. You begin to look at the young blossoms. You can see where the petals have dropped. Those are mites on those tips. These are the leaves that begin to show. And I don't know if this shows very well, but the mites that are on those cell, and, and where you have mites, you will have predators. So it is a beautiful, beautiful time to look at those leaves where they're home. You don't have to worry about sampling the whole tree. They're really right in the center of that crotch area. Look at it a little closer. This is uh, what you see, and you know, the interesting thing of this, I almost feel like Dr. Laura here, uh, <laughs> is that they're, they're all unwed mothers. These are, uh, these are uh, females that have been mated, the males die, okay? The only overwintering stages are the females that move up, they lay eggs on those central uh, leaves, female then, then dies. During this time of year, 
And this has been the foundation for the early treatment, believe it or not. I almost regret saying that, but this information developed the foundation for using uh, um, uh, miticides early in the season. They lay eggs. It's the coolest time of the year and the longest time that those eggs are going to require to hatch. Remember, they don't control their body temperature. Eggs are dependent on temperature. The cooler it is, the longer those eggs are going to hatch. So it's a perfect week window to utilize some sort of miticide at that time. The only weak point in that is you really don't know whether that's going to be needed or not. And in the days that we had a lot of predators, and actually this study, even the untreated blocks resulted in no buildup predators coming in and completely dropping the population. So again, I'm going back to what triggered this. You see the foliation by mites. You see when that quality of food goes down, they move down on the leaves. These are the wintering mites sprinkler heads, either they're going to die as a suicidal number, and I know each, you know, it was a farmer that showed me this. You know, here's a guy with uh, eight years of education, and a guy says, listen, this is what I'm seeing. And, and I know many of you have seen this very same thing, and they are going to be able to survive in the or uh, orchard. So I, I got thinking maybe we can uh, uh, play around with this using banding. And, and in this particular orchard, the banding was very effective. So we put bands around, I think, a half a dozen trees and then measured the mite population at three foot. Right here, I call that three foot at head height, at about six foot. And then further out at eight foot. So when we put bands in March, we had no mites developed during the season. This is mite days. Essentially, it's mite population over time. But think of it as uh, population, not mite days. It's a little bit easier. But no mites during the whole season. Where we had no ban, don't go no hunting with me. All right, Shane. Um, at the three foot level, you could see the development and the length of that population at a head height level. And then exterior, this is where the predator came in. Came in and began to establish, a, and actually where we had no banding on the tree, we got no, um, uh, the predators came in and reduced that population before the end of the season. That western predator mite is a very effective tool. but combination of permethrin and the combination of uh, miticide in the early spring have really reduced that population in orchards. You look at the development of predators, and this is just at, at uh, waist height, you can see they move with, with the mites. We had very low levels when we banded the trees above the band, and these are the levels. Once, and this is, this is beautiful, when you see something that in theory has been shown and it actually works out in practice, our, our levels show that if you have one mite, one predator mite for every leaf that has a, a web spinning mite, your population will crash on its own. And that's exactly what happened here. One mite, Predator, and then our this is a predator population, but our mite population uh, dropped along with that. We did this in a couple of orchards. On the older trees, we uh, not at the dark location, but the older trees, we found a little more roughened bark. So subsequent years, we began to either band these at the trunk, about 18 inches above the ground. We left some without bands. And then we had some on the primary scaffold of these trees. So this is an indication of wintering from the scaffold area or the trunk area. And again, you can see our highest populations are at three feet, where you get beautiful control with a sprayer, and even six feet. But our lowest populations uh, were in the 
uh, scaffold areas or the banded areas um, where we had uh, a band on the tree. So, tried some stuff with scaffold bands and, and trunk bands. We also took samples from the soil, and this was more to demonstrate, number one, are they wintering in the soil, and how deep are they wintering in the soil. It shows that they don't winter very deep, most of our population. If you just take a cup of soil, pull it from there, stick it on a sticky trap, and that behavior of the mite moving up, they come out of that dirt, move down, the cup and onto the sticky tarp. It makes it very, very easy to count. Unless you've got long hair and a beard. Four inches, lower populations, and very little at six. We did this with a core sample. So we're able to show that the, uh, there is some survival. And I think as we've planted trees on berms, it's been good for disease control. It's been good for ant establishment because they never get disturbed. And it's also been good for mite survival, particularly in the areas where it's very dry. So finally, I want to go to 1993, uh, where, you know, nobody's going to do this banding. Uh, uh, it's kind of fun to show the biology. But what if we put on a miticide, and this year we use an ovicide, Apollo, and also lime sulfur, I used actually, it's kind of scary, but I only treated the lower half of the tree with lime sulfur. This is a 10 pound rate of, uh, or a 10 gallon rate of lime sulfur that went on. Nobody does that in the growing season. This farmer let me do it. So again, our populations at three foot were highest when we had no bands. A little bit less where the trunk was banded, quite a bit less where we sampled where we banded the scaffolds, our lowest population was actually where we treated, and this is below the threshold, the threshold for treating mites is 150 mite days based on our work. Very good with Apollo, but also pretty darn good uh, with that line uh, sulfur spray. So, I think that's it, but I wanted to I wanted to show you the biology of these mites. I'm not talking about materials. Number one, the end results of this particular study, at least in the first few years, that where we had predators in that orchard, whether or not you sprayed for the mice, the population was controlled. So don't, the point being, don't be panicked if you see mites coalesced at the center of the tree. Number two, look in the hot spots of the orchards that you know for this very movement up into the center part of the tree. Don't pull the trigger too fast. Try to find out if there are predators present. You can't do that. Um, uh, I want to say call a farm advisor or your pest control advisor. Your pest control advisor needs to be able to show you what that predator looks like if you don't feel confident doing it. Now is the time to do that. Be ready if you're not finding predators and if you're using permethrin in your uh, orchard spray to control navel orange worm. Because in that situation, you probably are going to need an early season miticide. If you don't have predators, you've been using a broad spectrum spray. If you use a narrow spectrum spray, that in, in that sense I'm talking about the target of navel orange worm that does not trigger subsequent mite problems, you may, in the long run, be able to overcome this. What I would like to see each of you do is maybe on two acres of your farm, if you've been using permethrin, try to look at putting a tank load out of one of the softer materials that you use for navel orange root without that uh, uh, pyrethroid in there. And try to get a sense where you build some confidence that, you know, maybe I do not need this annual spray of a miticide. Particularly if you're on a well-irrigated orchard that doesn't go through stress. I know when your commodity is making money, it's easy to spend the money and go to sleep at night and not worry about it. I'm looking not so much at the misuse of a product as I am trying to keep a miticide available for use in those years that we do it. So I'll end my uh, presentation now and I'll be happy to try to take any questions that you might have.
Uh, Kenny? Can you comment on uh, people using uh, uh, dormant treatments with uh, pyrethroids? Dormant treatments with pyrethroids are not as dramatic. They're not as dramatic uh, an impact. Jim uh, Brazel, who was my, uh, he, he followed me in Kern County, actually did a little bit of a trial. We saw a slightly higher increase in mites with the dormant, and this was in Bakersfield, so it's your worst situation. We saw an increase in spider mites with those dormant treatments in field trials, but it's not nearly as dramatic as you see with uh, the uh, hull split spray that we do in season. Um, so I'm not as um, leery about that. I'm glad you folks brought that question up, though, to separate the in-season spray from the dormant season spray. Sarah, did you have a question? Same question. Okay. Any other questions? Dave, you want, um, yeah, Dave. You mentioned farm fighters. I know a lot of you guys are here from Fresno, Madera County, and I know we you won't have a, a real advisor. I mean, other well, almonds and tree crops, but I just wanted to let you know that we actually have a position vacancy announcement, which will be filled hopefully within the next six months to get you guys an advisor.